Welcome to Personal Finance Cat, where I share my personal take on personal finance. Many have predicted that China is on its way to take over the U.S. as the number one economy soon, and even the number one world power in geopolitical terms. At this point, there is pretty much no doubt that China's GDP is going to take over the U.S.'s. But how about the latter? The large and aging population, environmental pollution, significant income and wealth inequality, lack of protection for intellectual property, to name a few, all cast doubt on China's rising as the next number one world power. According to J.P. Morgan, China was described as uninvestable. Well, I've stayed in China this summer for about a month. As more of a background, I was born and raised in China and lived there until I graduated college. So I'm pretty familiar with the cultural and economic status of China. However, the last time I visited China before this prior trip was 10 years ago. So the change has been pretty astounding to say the least. In this episode, I'm going to talk about what I like about China and what I don't like about China. Most importantly, how I feel about investing in this country. To start with, the pros. Number one, modernity. Things are a lot more modern in China than in the US, from malls to hotels to train stations. It's very pleasant in general to use these modern facilities. Things work much more efficiently than those in the US. I experienced one flight delay by one hour, but other than that, nothing really. Number two, hospitality. Generally, people are very hospitable in China. The strangers I encountered were usually very friendly and helpful. The friends I haven't seen for a long time were very happy to see us and treated us well by inviting us to their places to hang out, paying for dinner at restaurants, giving us gifts, etc. It could be that the quality of the friendship is high, but I have a sense that treating guests nicely has a very deep cultural root. Needless to say, my family treated us extremely well, but family is family. Number three, high quality of customer service. One nice change I noticed is that customer service has gotten a lot better compared to when I was growing up. There has been a lot more competition in business, so it's a natural progression, but still it's nice to see. Even when we went to the police station to register as foreign visitors, the police officer had provided good customer service. Number four, affordability. Even though inflation has been a big problem similar to many other countries, including the US, things are still very affordable for US income earners. We stayed at a super nice Sheridan, not your average Sheridan, more like a Gilded Age Sheridan, and it was less than $100 a night for a standard room with a fancy buffet breakfast included. There was also a beautiful indoor pool as well, which the kids enjoyed. Number five, delicious food. Needless to say, there is an abundance of delicious Chinese food options available. That being said, I was also pleased with the non-Chinese food options available, which was not the case when I was growing up, especially Japanese food, which my son likes a lot. Topping that with affordable prices, we ate like kings and queens. Now moving on to the cons. Number one, uncleanness in certain areas. Even though the fancy places are beautiful and clean, Many places still lack basic sanitary equipment like toilets. Even in places like the hospital, only squatties are available, and oftentimes it stinks. And no toilet paper. That's certainly a cultural shock for my kids who had never seen anything like that. Number two, lack of certain amenities like air conditioning. Again, it's not a problem in fancy places like a five-star hotel, but in many places, including my parents' apartment, restaurants, and hospitals. There's no central AC. Being spoiled Americans, it was very difficult for my kids to adjust to. And for me, it was even hard to tolerate at first. There are also usually no dryers. People only use washing machines and air dry their clothes and no dishwasher. First world problems, I know, but American travelers beware. Number three, crowdedness. Even though the population has been on the decline, it's still a very populous country and crowdedness is very common. We experienced it in trains, at malls, at the hospital, and at entertainment venues. 
What's concerning to me and to many Chinese people is all the skyscraper apartment buildings, many of which have gotten very old and dilapidated in a relatively short amount of time for real estate, say 10 to 20 years. How are they going to tear down all these buildings and rebuild? It is unimaginable to me. Number four, environmental pollution. This is perhaps a more serious problem compared to some of the other cons above. I felt the smog immediately after I arrived. The country has been trying very hard to reduce pollution, but with a great scale of industrialization and large population, it's still a serious problem. Number five, unstable and restricted internet access. It is also very difficult to get stable internet while I was there. That was expected in my parents' apartment, but I was surprised that it's even the case in a five-star hotel we stayed at. I'm not sure if it's the infrastructure or the various restrictions that the government imposes. The latter is certainly more concerning. As you may know, many websites and apps are not accessible in China, like Google, YouTube, Amazon, and Netflix. Given how reliant we are on these sites, it was a big problem. Overall, though, I would say that the stay was very pleasant, with some nuisance we had to endure. It was definitely great to see family, and I would say generally they're happy with the state of the country. Last but certainly not least, would I be willing to invest in China? As the old adage says, "Never say never." That pretty much sums up how I feel. Currently, the only Chinese stock I own is Alibaba. On which I've made a loss so far, but I'm not planning on severing it quite yet. I still have some major concerns about the economy and the government, though. There is a huge debate even amongst some of the best investors of our time. Ray Dalio, for example, is a big proponent of China and is quite optimistic about the future of its economy. He has spoken many times about how he thinks that China is going to take over U.S. as the next world power. If you're interested, I'd recommend you to read his book, "Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order," and listen to the two podcast episodes he did with Lex Friedman. Charlie Munger was also famously very bullish about China and invested in BYD, which made a 30x return for Berkshire Hathaway. Although the jury is still out for Alibaba. On the other side, third-generation Chinese value investor Christopher Tsai. In a recent podcast episode on the Richer, Wiser, Happier podcast, very firmly confirmed his position of not wanting to invest in China due to the lack of IP protection, which stifles creativity, and the authoritarian government, which makes long-term planning challenging. So, where do I stand? I think China has certainly had its good run, but lately its economy has slowed quite significantly, especially marked by their real estate market. There might still be great companies that could gain significant market share and grow like crazy, but it is going to be very difficult to identify a company like this early enough to be able to reap the huge gains that justify the challenges outlined above, and the downsides from the mistaken judgments. Because remember, you are not going to be able to only pick winners, like Monish Pobrai, the Indian Warren Buffett likes to say. Even the best value investors are wrong one third of the time. To sum up, I'm in holding pattern in terms of looking at Chinese companies to invest. The challenges caused by the government and its related policies, coupled with the overall economic environment, makes me very cautious to invest in China for now. That being said, I'm confident that things are going to pick up. You will not be on the high all the time, and similarly, you will not stay in the trench forever. I believe, and I hope, one day the right leader or leaders will come along, like a second coming of Deng Xiaoping, to design policies that encourage more innovation and make it more business friendly, while staying politically neutral, like what the Singapore government has been doing. All right, that's it for today. What are your thoughts about China? Have you invested or plan to invest in Chinese companies? Let me know in the comments section below. Thank you so much for listening.